We have all heard about piracy in the Caribbean. But across the Panama Isthmus lured a continent of gold and silver mines, the beating heart of the Spanish Empire. Pirates had only ever dreamt of striking these uncharted waters, that is, until 1679, when the 300 buccaneers under Captain Coxon crossed into the Pacific Ocean. What awaited them here? Poverty? Riches? We know rather well, because unlike most pirates who burnt any written accounts of their crimes, several of these soldiers of fortune left behind written journals and opinions of the voyage. Whilst most pirates took their prizes without a fight, these men will fight gruesome battles on sea and land. They will meet with strange men, strange peoples, strange animals, and risk their undoing over internal disputes. This is the greatest pirate tale you've never been told. Who were these 300 soldiers of fortune, spurred southwards by the sacred hunger of gold? William Dampier, the most famous of the 300, said that they were sawyers, carpenters, joiners, brickmakers, bricklayers, shoemakers, tailors, and so on. Some amongst them could neither read nor write, whilst others were of educated or even aristocratic stock. Many of them were veteran buccaneers that had fought under Morgan, and many of them were former baymen, the logwood cutters active in Belize, before turning back to their old trade. We know little about the buccaneers' leader, Captain John Coxon, only that he was elected the admiral for a five-boat armada in 1679. His party purchased a French privateering commission for just ten ducats and cast off from Jamaica. The commission would only last them three months, but these buccaneers would sail under its jurisdiction for the next three years. England had also made it illegal for its captains to operate under foreign commission. Anyway, Coxon's company numbered 97 men and he flew a red flag, and he captained a ship of 80 tons and 8 guns. After plundering the city of Portobello, the buccaneers split their loot and rendezvoused on the island of Boco del Toro, where they met with fellow captains Peter Harris and Richard Sawkins. Harris commanded the largest ship in the fleet, Dutch built, weighing 150 tons and carrying 25 or 32 guns. On land, he marched with a green flag. Richard Sawkins, commanding only an unarmed boat, would become known as a cocky and fearless fighter, if not reckless. His flag was red striped with yellow. Edmund Cook commanded a similar boat and flew a similar flag, only that it had a hand holding a sword for device. The last captain and anti-hero of this story we know rather well, Bartholomew Sharp, born around 1650 in London. An excellent seaman, he had fought with Morgan, as a privateer against the Dutch, then could log with as a bayman before finally joining the other captains in piracy. William Dampier and Lionel Welfare called Sharp a coward and an incompetent, whilst Basil Ringrose praised Sharp as an excellent commander, and would he often speak of Sharp's hunting skills and marksmanship in his journal. Sharp even wrote his own journal of the adventure, giving us a glimpse into his personality. What we do know is that he was one of the greatest rogues in pirate history, and a villain to boot. A surprising amount of educated eccentrics travelled with the 300. The most famous was William Dampier. He had arrived in the West Indies around a decade prior, worked on a plantation, lived as a bayman and even escaped the Spanish coast guard in a ship chase. He would write several books throughout his life and is celebrated today as one of the greatest natural scientists of the period, having introduced words such as guacamole into the English lexicon. Next up is Basil Ringrose. He was born in England around 1653 and arrived in the New World as a Jamaican planter's apprentice. He was a navigator, geographer and author, and drew several shots of the locations they visited. His account of the voyage is the most extensive and my prime source for this series. Since he was fluent in both French and Latin, Bass quickly learned Spanish and acted as the company's interpreter. Lionel Wafer was a Welshman, possibly born in the 1660s. He said he was very young in 1677, and served then as a surgeon's apprentice in, to the East Indies. Instead of returning to England, he met his brother in Jamaica and settled in Port Royal as a surgeon. A year later, he joined Captain Cook on a voyage to Darien, where they met up with the other buccaneers. Wafer, Ringrose and Dampier would all become good friends, and one might easily imagine them striding a corpse-strewn beach post-battle, discussing the sights they've seen and sharing scientific notes. These very different men make up the main cast of buccaneers, 
but we also have some characters mentioned on the side of their journals. We have Swan, an 80-year-old buccaneer that had served at Cromwell in Ireland before sailing with the Western design and becoming a buccaneer. He would die in a future piratical expedition when surrounded by a group of Spaniards. John Tucker was a seaman born and bred, an alphabet but an excellent dancer. He danced so well that some of the captains taught him nobility. Mr. Richard Gobson had served as a druggist apprentice in London. Wafer called Gobson an ingenious man and an excellent scholar. He carried with him a Greek testament, which he often translated and read out loud to any willing buccaneer. There were likewise a splish splash of French and Dutchmen in the company, along with free blacks and Indians. Most of the Indians were from the Mosquito Coast, excellent fishers and allied to the English. The company also maintained a lot of slaves, which were used for menial labor and carrying their backpacks. Some of these slaves would be freed during the adventure, others would try to escape. The buccaneers would also take new slaves from amongst their enemies. After recovering from the Portobello raid, the buccaneers landed in Darien, leaving their ships behind in the hopes of stealing the riches of this land. The Spaniards had silver mines to the south and watched for gold in the many rivers. They captured an Indian and asked him where the money was at, to which he replied, Mucho oro hay en Tocamora, that is, there is much gold in Tocamora. Tocamora is where they marched next. On the way there, the buccaneers went to meet more Indians and their leader, Emperor Andreas. He was very old, Sharp thought that he must have been a hundred years, and described him as only wearing a cloak around the waist and an English hat. One of the buccaneers speculated that either Andreas or his ancestors had been baptized, due to him bearing a Christian name. But when they met him, the natives upheld no Christian rites. Lionel Wafer, who would later live with the Darien natives for several years, described their sorcerers who would communicate with an entity the Christians called Devil, and gain foresight into the future. Indeed, Emperor Andreas and his people had been much wronged by the Spaniards and were in open and continual war with them. The Spaniards referred to them as wild Indians or bravos, where the English word braves originates from. The buccaneers decided to enter an alliance with Andreas. This served several purposes. Rather than fight against two opponents, they could ally with the poor but ferocious Indians against their mutual enemy, the wealthy Spaniards. Secondly, the buccaneers were in uncharted territories which the natives knew like the backs of their hands. Thirdly, and most interestingly, is that the alliance gave them some sort of legitimacy. Their French commission was fading away, but now they were fighting under the jurisdiction of an emperor. They had been taken on as mercenaries or even commissioned privateers under an Indian ruler. Don Andreas, as Sharp called him, led the buccaneers to the village ruled by his son, King Augustine, also known as Bonette de Oro, Golden Cap. This name derived from his crown, which was made from woven white reeds, red silk and a thin plate of gold stuck with three ostrich feathers and golden beads. He lived on a large plantation with several children and a queen, and hated the Spaniards very personally. His daughter had been kidnapped, raped and impregnated by a Spanish soldier, and he naturally wanted to see her liberated. As you might imagine, Augustine was very pleased to provision the pirates. His subjects pressed fruit into each soldier's lap, and the king invited them to party at his home. He entertained them so well that they spent the entirety of the next day in leisure. The buccaneers wrote how beautiful the women were, but their intimate experiences might have varied. Wafer and Ringrose described them as friendly, but modest and afraid of their husband's jealousy. Sharp, however, said that they were so exceedingly loving and free to the embraces of strangers. When the festivities died, Golden Cap ordered that each man be issued tree plantains and sugar canes to suck on. They were given canoes to travel up river and were accompanied by as many as 150 Indians, armed with spears, bows and arrows, amongst whom were the emperor, the king and their sons. Whenever they needed food, they foraged for it or had it acquisitioned from locals by the command of their emperor. Same for lodgings, when, whenever they came upon a sufficiently sized building, Andreas ordered that the company should be quartered inside. Emperor Andreas promised heaps of gold to be found at the town of Santa Maria, a town he wished to reconquer from the Spanish. In case of poor pickings, the buccaneers agreed that they would attack Panama City or cross the Isthmus into the South Seas, where they could plunder all their way down the Peruvian coast. Santa Maria was a small town with a little fort serving as a guard post for the workers collecting gold dust from the river. They landed around midnight and crawled so close to the fort they could hear the sentry talking. At seven in the morning they heard a drum beat and some muskets firing salute. The Spanish were discharging the watch. This was the time. Whilst the main company kept up suppressive fire on the walls, Richard Sawkins led the vanguard in a charge against the palisades. 
Inside were around 200 men firing arquebuses, throwing lances and shooting bows. One man was struck in the hand and Sawkins himself allegedly took an arrow to the head. This did not stop the madman. With two or three more men he pulled down three palisades and the company rushed inside. The Spaniards swiftly surrendered. According to the buccaneers, Sawkins and the other guy were the only wounded men and they were healed rather quickly. Sawkins must have gotten quite the scar. The Spanish lost 70. The Indians apparently hid during most of the battle, being terrified of gunfire. But when the buccaneers entered the town, they found it a measly place built from reeds, and all of the treasure carried away before their attack. Captain Sawkins took 10 men and a canoe, and they went up river to find it, to no avail. The commanders gathered in council to discuss their next move. Most of them wanted to continue southwards and attack Panama. But Coxon, however, represented the contingent that wanted to return to the Caribbean. Coxon had started to lose popularity. A few days prior he had gotten into a violent argument with Captain Harris, in which Coxon had fired his musket at Harris. Sharp was able to intervene and stop the quarrel before Harris fired back. But, let's just say, some were fine with letting Coxon go. The problem was that he commanded a lot of soldiers which would be needed for the attack on Panama. The captains were forced to appease Coxon by electing him as their general, much to his satisfaction. He agreed and resolved to lead the attack on Panama. The taking of Santa Maria was more successful for the Indians. Most of the denizens were slaves or oppressed Indians, no doubt glad to be liberated by their kinsmen. They were likewise able to rescue Golden Cap's daughter, who was with child after being raped. In retaliation, the Indians dragged off around 70 captives and stabbed them to death before the buccaneers could intervene. Most importantly, they managed to save a Chilean named Joseph Gabriel, who would serve them as a pilot for many months to come. He was in fact the one who had kidnapped and raped Golden Cap's princess, and was willing to go to any lengths to save his own skin from what fates the Indians had in store. He promised not only to lead the pirates to Panama, but to the governor's very bedchamber. Not all Indians were content with this clemency, and understandably so, and most of them decided to return home. Emperor Andreas and King Augustine, however, he, they were sold to join the attack on Panama. On the 17th of April, 1680, after two days of occupation, the buccaneers burned the fort, church and town, at the request of King Augustine, and departed in a fleet of 36 boats. Two days later, they entered the South Sea in all its vastness and glory. It must have been quite a sight, and the buccaneer journals all described it very well. Their journey down the ebb of the river had not been so pleasant. Captain Sawkins had tried to catch the fleeing governor to no avail. It was raining heavily and no clothes would protect them. The river turned brackish and they had to find inland ponds for fresh water. Basil Ringrow sat in a very sluggish boat that struggled at rowing down the river. He and his companions were even left behind at one point. When they finally entered the South Sea they were met by great winds, one of which capsized poor Basil's boat. The arms and ammunition went unscathed, being lashed to the boat and waxed but the food and fresh water were utterly spoiled. Bass was shipwrecked along with a group of Spanish prisoners and Indians and troubles arose, in which he had to mediate. A few days later he ended up as a prisoner to a larger Spanish party who had previously been set free by the buccaneers. After the Spanish commander heard of Basil's defense of his countrymen, he embraced the explorer and told him that the English were very friendly enemies and good people, but the Indians were a treacherous nation. Basil was let go and later rejoined the company, who weren't in any better position. A heavy rain had forced them ashore, where they had built a few huts to recover. Water was getting scarce. Captain Sawkins had sallied out three times to try and catch the escaping governor from Santa Maria, to no avail again. The governor had even left behind two black women to lighten the load of his canoe. On the 20th, the fleet of canoes arrived at the island of Plantain to search for water. They found only stinking filth, but being so reduced, they were forced to lap it all up regardless. At Plantain they captured a bark of 30 tons weight. Sharp made her his flagship and had her crewed by 130 fellows, all eager to get out of their canoes. From their captives they learned of an island called Chepillo, apparently rich with provisions. Captain Coxon spotted a Spanish bark under sail and pursued in his canoe. One of his men, one Mr. Bull, was killed in the engagement, and five others were wounded. The bark escaped. The next day they searched the islands for provisions with, without any luck. Water began to grow scarce, so Sharp and Cook with their bark and a crew of 130 men decided to split from the company in search of water. At the Pearl Islands, Sharp and Cook managed to capture a brigantine being outfitted to pursue them. Whoops. In the woods, Sharp met a beautiful woman and took her to an abandoned house. 
He found some wine, drank from it and presented his services to the woman, whatever that means. He also said that he was a more pleasing guest to her when she understood what countryman he was. I'm not entirely sure what he meant by this, but I'll leave the passage for your own interpretation. Anyway, Sharp took the brigantine as his new flagship, loaded it with wooden jars of water, destroyed his old bark to fuck with the Spanish and sailed back to Chapillo. When he returned, the camp had been burned and the buccaneers were gone. Thank you so much for watching the first episode in my three-part series on the Pacific Adventure. This is a huge project done for my own amusement and has required of me to read through several period texts and journals from actual pirates to try and form a cohesive narrative and something close to the truth. I hope you enjoyed this underrated piece of history as much as I enjoyed making it. Stay tuned for the upcoming parts. But in the meanwhile, why don't you tell me in the comments which of the characters from the adventure you liked the most and why? Huge thanks to my generous supporters on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Dweck, Peter Tisson, Red Raider 88 and Michael Jens. If you want to support me monetarily, please check out the links to PayPal and Patreon in the description below. If you can't, that's fine. Consider giving the video a like or leaving a comment, even just a shitpost, so the algorithm will spread it to more viewers. Cheers.